so-called buffaloes here at the Forum Toastmasters Club have been members since, dare I say, the 1980s. None more than our next and final speaker for this evening, which happens to be a first in the 34 years that I've been a member of this august organization. A masterclass. Why didn't we think of this particular word? Very appropriate in at least letting us as the audience understand the subject matter which we're about to experience. We all, as Toastmasters, have to write a speech, and perhaps one of the most difficult one aspects of writing a speech are just that sitting down and how do we go about we have an expert in our midst this evening, ladies and gentlemen. As I said, he's been a Toastmaster and a member of the Forum Club since 1984. He has, in his time, reached four different speech contest levels at district level. He, as a newspaper man, has reported on more speeches, good and bad, than he can, in fact, remember. And for a number of years was a speech writer for a diversity of different speakers for the Corporation of Economic Development. He is, of course, a former editor of the, a daily newspaper in Southwest Africa, now, of course, Namibia, and he also worked for a number of years as a sub-editor on the main newspaper in Hobart in Tasmania. He has, and a lot of us will appreciate, a great understanding, of course, of the English language. And I am, and I'm sure you are all, waiting to hear the master class on speech writing. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please put your hands together and welcome to the lectern, competent Toastmaster, Mr. Tony Kondabat. Toastmaster, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a time capsule back some decades. Before 1994, in fact, two or three decades before that momentous date. We have a situation there where the president of the day announced a new fiscal and economic development strategy and program for what he called the Commonwealth Southern African States. I won't go into detail about the, 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 the structure of that strategy, he said. I leave it to one of my ministers who will be speaking within a month to tell us exactly what is to be done about developing Southern Africa. Now, it was unfortunate that the minister assigned to give this great revelation to the nation about the fiscal and economic developments of the Commonwealth of Southern African States was not the Minister of Finance, it was not the Minister of Economic Affairs, it was not the Minister of Foreign Affairs, it was the Minister of Sport, <laughs> who was known to the opposition and the press as Pitt Promises for his habit of making more promises than he could possibly implement. Well, even more unfortunately, I, as a speechwriter for the Corporation of Economic Development, was assigned to government service for a short time to draft this speech for the Minister of Sport on the fiscal and economic development of the Commonwealth of Southern African States. Now, I realize, of course, this is a landmark speech far beyond Thumbsuck level. So I presented myself in the office of the Minister of Sport and I told him, Minister, I am, have great pleasure in announcing that I have been assigned to draft your speech on this important subject of the fiscal and economic development of the Commonwealth of Southern African States, but I need to know what it is that you want to say. You've got to give me the information and I can craft your speech. And his 
response was, you fail. What the heck do I know about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, in view of the fact that it was a landmark, landmark speech, I approached eminent authority in the private world on fiscal and economic development. I asked him for his help in his CPS by all means. Now, it just so happened that in his political life, he was the leader of the Progressive Party opposition in the Transvaal Provincial Council. So together, the leader of the opposition and I sat down around the table and crafted the economic development policy for the government, National Party government of South Africa. The speech went down very well indeed, not least with the Minister of Sport who had to deliver it. I went along actually to watch him and observe him deliver it. And he was so impressed that at one stage he actually paused in his speech and turning to the chairman of the organizing committee next to him, and without switching off the mic, he said, actually with an atmosphere of awe in his speech, yeah, this is a really good speech. <laughs> 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 now, ladies and gentlemen, I go into this little anecdote. Well, for two reasons. One, it is to highlight the attention that we all need in preparing our speeches of an attention grabbing intro, which I think our friend Pete promises granted me with his very good speech. The other aspect, that is the one aspect, the other aspect is the need that if we don't know what we're going to speak about, we need to research it. It might be something foreign to us, but to research it, which I did by bringing in the leader of the opposition. So let's park those two things to one side for the moment. The intro, attention grabbing intro, and the need for research. The part I'll come back to. Now, in starting our speech, to prepare our speech, we don't immediately pick up a pen and start working on a piece of paper or grab a keyboard or a laptop and start working on it. No, there are three actions that need to be taken before we're starting to write our speech. The first, of course, is to analyze your audience. But tailor your speech to the audience concerned. It might be a specific profession that you're going to address, or maybe an industry of some sort, like the construction industry or the agricultural industry. It might be a special interests group. It might be a special age group. Maybe something to do with age, young people or old people. It could be a gender organized, gender based audience in which case you've got to watch your words depending where you are, or it could be based on the educational level of your audience. And that is very important at educational level. Prince Charles, some decades ago, made a real boo-boo on this lot. He was visiting Canada, and he made a rattling good speech on the link between the historic links between the United Kingdom and Canada, their joint position in the Commonwealth of Nations, the role that they could play in the development of the other countries in the Commonwealth and in the rest of the world, a rattling good speech, except for one thing. The audience that he was discussing was the Lumberjacks Union. <laughs> <laughs> now, with all due respect to Lumberjacks, whose job it is to chop trees down, roll the logs down, chuck them into a river and float them down to the sawmill, and then break up the log jams when they appear, appear, appear. <coughs> his speech was way above the level of his audience, so the speech fell flat. So flat, in fact, that it made news on both sides of the Atlantic and both sides of the equator. That's how I'm going to hear it. Right, that's the one thing, analyze your audience. The next thing, your well, speech must have a purpose. And the purpose is to equate your audience with something that they must take home with and think about and perhaps act upon. Now, it could be simply an informative speech in which you've got to give them information that they didn't have before. It could be a call to action in which you want them to get home. They can't wait for the next day to get stuck in and start organizing and putting this, this action into, into practice. It could be a 21st birthday or graduation, <coughs> in which case you've got to inspire the young people to really make something of their lives. It could be a retirement function or even a funeral oration, new eulogy, in which case your purpose is to give people a great sense of gratitude 
you know what you see speech. Even an after dinner speech, when people have got a good couple of wines and a good dinner under their belts and they relax and sitting down, now what's this guy going to say to us? And it needs to be a bit of an entertaining speech by all means, but at the same time, you must give it something to take home with it. This is the purpose of your speech. You must have something to take home. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. This applies to virtually every type of speech except for a story or an out and out knock them down with laughter, humorous speech, which has the purpose of entertaining people. But for the rest, if you haven't got a purpose, something that you want them to take home, you're wasting your time. Just a lot of hot air. And the third point, now here I can get one of these things out of the parking lot, one about research. If it is not something that you are familiar with, obviously it needs to be researched, as I researched the one with the head of the opposition. Now, with all this preliminary work, that you've got to do before you even start on your speech. Nevertheless, everything's got to go into it. You will understand the Toastmasters dictum that for every minute you're going to speak, you need to prepare for at least an hour. That is a thing that you must bear in mind. You can't make a several minute speech on half an hour's, uh, half an hour's preparation. Right. Now we come to thing that Lynette mentioned, the structure of the speech, the very broad structure of the speech. We're all told, of course, we all know it must have an intro, it must have a body, and it must have a conclusion. The intro, we're all told, must grab the attention, uh, in, in, in the body of your speech, you develop your theme, and the purpose of the conclusion is acknowledgement of the fact that the average person listening to a speech of whatever length remembers only the last part that he heard. So your conclusion is extremely important. There lies what you want them to take home. It's got to be co contained in your conclu conclusion. Now there's another dictum, another way of looking at the sit of your body, your, you know, your intro, your body, and your conclusion. And it's described as, tell them what you're going to tell them, and tell them, then tell them what you have told them. Now this might sound fairly obvious, but why tell them what you're going to tell them? and then afterwards tell them what you have told them. Well, the first part, tell them what you are going to tell them. Your audience, let's say it's a, it's a company group, or it's an industry, whatever, it's a special interest group, they have no idea what you're going to speak about. Most meetings of this sort take place in the morning, they've arrived there, they've fought their way through the traffic, they sit down, and their minds are a bit floating around. What you do then is, you tell them what you're going to tell them. And this arrests their mind. Aha, that could be of use to me. And then that either professionally or personally. Then, in the body of your speech, again, you might not be on the same page, or they might not be on the same page as you are all the way through. And so, what you do then is you need your strong conclusion to make sure that they take home what you intend to take home, which is your purpose in making your speech. So right, you've got the broad structure of the speech. Now we're ready to start drafting it. Pen on paper, your fingers on your keyboard. Logic tells us a good place, the best place to start is at the beginning. That makes sense, doesn't it? But actually not, not in this case. Not unless you've got a very clear idea of the intro that you want. That can be saved until last. So why sidestep this preparing of the intro until after you've done the rest of the speech? Well, the body and the conclusion might suggest a far more attention-grabbing intro than you would have thought of before. Only when you've worked on it, you really see what you can <coughs> grab the attention with. But also the statement of what you're going to tell them. You might have had a vague idea of it before, or a fairly strong idea, but once you've drafted the, the context, the body, and drafted your, your, your conclusion, then you have a very clear idea of how to grab them with the, grab the attention with the intro and tell them what you want to tell them. So right, now we can start with drafting the speech. But even there, leave that pen aside, leave that <coughs> keyboard aside, the preliminary work is obviously some mind in there. You've got quite 
after a lot of information you've got to give them, mind mapping, write down points in no particular order, this is the way it's done, and then arrange that once you've got that, and take a good couple of days, I found that useful, a good couple of days with your mind mapping, and then arrange it in order, chronological order, or order of importance, or order of urgency, whatever the case might be for the speech that you are working on, only you can know that. And then, then with all your facts at your disposal, and the order in which you want to put it, now, at last, you can start drafting your speech. Now here we come to a type of syndrome that some speakers have, I see it quite often in my church. The sort of person who thinks, oh, I give them all they've got to take home. And in fact, the exact opposite applies. The more you try and cram into their minds, people can only absorb so much their minds switch off, they go over to their shopping list, or their plans for the weekend, or whatever else might be exercising their mind at the moment. And so, well, bearing in mind here, you need such a thing as information overload. You can get it in one speech. And so, the obvious thing is not to make your speech too long or too verbose. To keep it simple, by all means. Keep it tight and uh, point and point it. A lot of material that is supportive but can be left out Leave it out, because you're only losing your, your audience that way. Now, a very important aspect. In drafting your body, the body of the speech, think of three main pillars. By all means, they need development, but just three main pillars. Research shows that the human mind can absorb and handle only three main pillars at a time. For instance, you've discussed the first point. Now you're on your second point, and your audience can still link what you're saying with your first point. And when you're on your third pillar, yes, this makes sense. It follows up with what he said in the second and the first. still makes sense. But when you get onto your four, five, six, and seven pillars, you've lost them again. Again, the shopping list takes over. And so, one must wonder now why. Why is this three pillars? And so, absolutely valid. It is illustrated to us by the typical joke. Even a joke has three points the Englishman, the Scotsman, and the Irishman. <laughs> <laughs> the Irishman is always the butt of the joke. I know I'm Irish on my mother's side, but you know, I've it all too well. But if you try to extend it, the Englishman, the Scotsman, the Irishman, the Dutchman, the Greek, and the Bulgarian, <laughs> the joke is twice as long then and half as effective. In fact, it might not be funny at all. And you might discover the hard way that Bulgarians have got no sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the moral is limit your speech to three main pillars. By all means, develop them, but only three main pillars. Right. Now, your actual <coughs> presentation, you do your, 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 your writing. Short, uncomplicated sentences. I've had people. Expressing such a long sentence that by the time he's finished, I don't know where he started. So short, uncomplicated sentences. And then paragraphs. You're reading a book or a magazine, you have paragraphs. When a new idea or a new trend comes in, it's a new paragraph. So write that or speech in that way with definite paragraphs. And then, then when the delivery comes, that your delivery also has got verbal, verbal paragraphs. A slight pause from one aspect where you go into the next, and perhaps a device to introduce it. Something like the word however, or in addition, or by contrast, or moreover. This highlights the breaks between the different sections, the different verbal parag uh, scriptural paragraphs and your verbal paragraphs. In that way, you keep your audience with you. At least they can determine one paragraph the next. Now, it's not my job here to speak about the presentation and the body language and so on. Someone else, I'm sure, will be doing a masterclass on that. But the time to start thinking of your presentation is when you're actually drafting your speech. Provide such things as an end dash when you want to put in forms. The purpose being to get your, 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 your audience's attention or maybe, 
the little devices in your script for your sake only, a part where you reduce the tone of your voice because I've got something like very serious to tell you. Seventeen and a half minutes now. <laughs> To, to reduce you, to, to, to get your audience attention, something serious you can say. Or perhaps to raise it quite loud. When you want to say something like, this is the sort of conduct that we will not accept. In your drafting the speech, that's the place to make your notes for your presentation. The same with props. Avoid excessive props. Props support your speech, they don't constitute your speech. And also, if your props are on a screen, by all means, make them large enough to be seen. Perhaps only three lines, and definitely not screen full with a table full of figures. Remember, you're only there to support, so keep them limited and only in support of your speech. Props are useful, but only when used with circumspection. Consider some personal comments here and there, very useful. On the subject of rambling on too far, Will and I, Will Valka and I, were at a function with our respective wives, sitting separately, but we agreed that at the reception afterwards, we would together evaluate the speaker, who happened to be the Deputy Director of Education of the Transform Education Department. Now this fellow rambled on for ever. It was important. The seat, if it's a Friday evening, had a long, busy week, very comfortable seat, a nice headrest. And unfortunately, when I met up with Will at the reception, he said, Well, you go first with your evaluation. I said, I can't evaluate the man. But I went to sleep, fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I must rely on you. In this case, it was exactly the same. It is a classic example of bringing in a personal personal comment, but also avoiding and rambling on. Also, some humour, a bit of appropriate humour is usually useful as well. It, it livens things up. Right, so technical details of your text you are typing it. Obviously, 1.5 spacing. If it's single spacing, you lose your, you lose your way in it. Upper and lower case, not all capitals. Some people say that it's all big, it's easy to see. It's not, you, you lose yourself. The top two thirds of the page only, so you don't end up reading the bottom of your page like that if you've got to read. Number your pages, I've seen it twice when the person dropped his speech and they weren't numbered and it was a performance getting it back into order. And uh, yellow highlight your important names that you mustn't forget, important figures, and talk your figures round them off. Two million rocks, not one million nine hundred and ninety-seven thousand three hundred and ninety-two rock thirty-five cents. <laughs> Nobody gets that. Right, now you've completed the body of your speech, but how do you know that every member of your audience will perceive the essential message as it is intended? This is where the conclusion comes in. So there's all this out of marking that as well now. It needs to be strong, and brief, and to the point. Perhaps three bullet points aligned to the to the, the, the three main points of your the body of your speech. The three bullet points. That will guide you in the strong delivery of your into of your, your conclusion. And that obviously is what your audience will take home, and that is the purpose of your speech. All parts of the speech are important. But there is a, a first among equals, so to say. This is like the Pope who's the first among equals in the College of Cardinals, and that is your conclusion. The conclusion obviously doesn't stand on its own, it can't stand on its own, but uh, without a conclusion, without a good and strong conclusion, your speech is a total waste of time. It's just nothing more than hot air. Right, we finish now with that conclusion. So, is our speech finished? Well, not yet. Remember, there's still that introduction that we left in the parking lot. So now's the time we wall that out, Crafted as a strong attention grabbing device based on the body of the speech and the conclusion. We've now got the strongest information we have on which we can base that introduction. It could take the form of a question, pose a question, 
and answer it in your body of your speech and particularly in the conclusion. And the section also where you're going to tell your audience what you're going to tell them. It can be the same part, of the same paragraph as the introduction, or it can be a separate one following afterwards. I'll give you a little example here, hypothetical of course, of a statement grabbing a dramatic introduction and then a statement of what you're going to tell your audience. Ladies and gentlemen of South Africa's construction <coughs> industry, you're all too aware that your industry is facing hard times and has shed 50% of its workforce with serious consequences for the national economy. Well, I have good news for you. I have liberty to provide in my address to follow with information from three impeccable sources that an upturn is about to commence within the current year and that not only will it benefit your companies but also will kickstart growth in all <coughs> sectors of the South African economy. So there you've told them what you're going to tell them. And by means of a device like that, you will, like a border collie, rounding up strange sheep, you will have your entire audience waiting, hanging on your every word. What is this now? He's coming. Good news. He's told us what's coming. Now let's listen to it. They'll be hanging on your every word throughout your speech. Because you've told them what it is that's coming. And as a result, with a well-structured body and a brief but strong conclusion, you will have what that former Minister of Sports it promises to once again described as very good speech. <laughs> <laughs>